I'm Steve Kosser. I'm a licensed psychologist and a certified school psychologist in Pennsylvania. I started practicing psychology with a license in Pennsylvania in 1981, so I've been at this for a while. What I want to do in this presentation is combine an awareness of Medicaid as a funding source with how to get insurance funding and how to keep insurance funding. So you'll hear me refer to insurance funding generally. It applies to Medicaid, it applies to private insurance, Blue Cross, Aetna, Magellan, anywhere you go. The same strategy that I'm going to describe to you here related to Med Medicaid is applicable to every insurance company on earth. And here's the even better part. The strategy for getting and keeping insurance funding that I'm going to describe is applicable for podiatry. So we're going to talk about how to get and keep insurance funding for necessary treatment. And I'm going to focus mainly on psychological treatment, behavioral support for children under the age of 21. I just want to give a quick introduction to the organization that I created. What I suggest you do, if you find interest in any of the things I'm talking about, go to the website that's on the screen, ibc-pa.org. That is the Institute for Behavior Change. There's a whole bunch of material there that's available at no cost. I have some shameless self-promotional literature up there on the table. Please take one or two copies if you have a friend who wasn't able to make it today. I'm thankful to be here at the National Federation of Families for Children's Mental Health. This is the second time I've addressed this group. The first time was about four years ago, and that presentation forms the foundation for the book that I wrote called The Issachar Project. For those of you who might not be familiar with the children of Issachar, they were one of the 12 tribes of ancient Israel, and they were renowned because they understood the times and they knew what to do. So I fancy myself as being one of the children of Issachar. What I'm going to talk about is insurance companies and mental health providers. <coughs> and the thing you have to understand once you address that issue is that there is a fundamental reality. There's a necessary adversarial relationship that exists between ethical treatment providers and insurance companies. So I found this Warner Brothers cartoon. I'm a big fan of Daffy Duck. This is this sums it right up. <laughs> okay, there you have it. They make bullets. We, as providers, have to make armor. And as they get better at making bullets, we have to get better at making armor. It just It's that simple. So the problem is sometimes you encounter an insurance company that has gotten so good at making bullets that you just plain have to get out of their influence. And I encountered that in one county in Pennsylvania and left there back in October. This is a short summary of who I am and my pedigree, if you want. I'm a licensed psychologist and a certified school psychologist in Pennsylvania, certified in 83, licensed in 81. I was a national advisor for the National Wraparound Initiative, and I am not in that organization any longer. I am a member of the Pennsylvania Psychological Association. I have a master's degree from Fairleigh Dickinson University in Madison, New Jersey. Been in psychology private practice since 1981 created the Network for Behavior Change in 97, founded the Institute for Behavior Change, which is a nonprofit foundation that monitors, recruits, trains, deploys people who work under the scope of practice of the network psychologists. The network has the contracts, the institute provides the staff, and it provides a healthy separation between the professionals who are responsible for the treatment program and the I don't want to say non-professionals, because they're not. They are professionals, but if somebody in the institute makes a misstep, they are not able to bring down the entire network because of that separation. I also created the Children's Behavioral Health Center in 2006. It's been operating ever since, and my hope is that it will continue to expand the reach of the philosophy that I'll be talking about today. 
You can also go to treatmentplansthatworked.com where you can get 576 treatment plans that worked with the data that confirms that they actually did work uh, for the whopping fee of $65. So it's a good deal, I think, more, more ways than one. And finally, there is our case manager.pro, which allows me to provide support to families anywhere on earth, not just in Pennsylvania, because I will be providing that support as a case manager as opposed to a licensed psychologist. This is a letter that my, at that time, elected representative received from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, signed by Cindy Mann or her associate. And it says, more or less, we agree that Mr. Kosser has a great deal of expertise and is a passionate supporter of EPSDT. Now, this is not an endorsement. CMS doesn't endorse anything or anybody. It's an acknowledgement. Everything that I've created in the last 20 to 30 years has been sent to CMS for review and approval. So when they say that I have a great deal of expertise, they know from experience that I do. Let's talk a little bit about wraparound because this is sort of, in some ways, the bane of my existence. There are so many people who misunderstand wraparound as if it's a treatment modality. It is not. It's a cup. If you don't put anything in the cup in the way of bona fide treatment, you're not monitoring or assessing the progress of anything. So don't be confused by wraparound, even though some of the adherents to it, mostly state and county officials, have a habit of referring to it as a treatment. The people from the National Wraparound Initiative, Eric Bruns included, are fast to, to say, even in federal court, it's not a replacement for treatment, it's a way of monitoring it and engaging providers in a collaborative effort to wrap around the child. And in that sense, I endorse the philosophy of wraparound vigorously. Let's talk about medically necessary treatment, because this is the foundation for funding through any insurance company anywhere on earth. The services have to be prescribed correctly. If they're prescribed ineptly or incompletely, you give the insurance company a chink in the armor. Can't do that. You have to prescribe it correctly, which closes that avenue of attack. After you've prescribed it and it gets authorized and funded, you have to make sure it's delivered correctly. Because if you don't deliver it correctly, you've lied to the insurance company about what you're going to do, and they will fully exploit that opening of the armor. So you have to have a clear understanding of what the rules are for your given insurance company in order to do this treatment delivery process successfully. Now, one of the things to understand is there are two worlds. There is a commercial world that is over here, and they have their own rules about what's medically necessary. And they vary state by state, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, insurance company by insurance company. You have to look at their medical necessity criteria to determine if your treatment plan, your prescription, is written correctly. If it doesn't meet those medical necessity criteria, it's not going to get funded. So when you talk about Magellan or Aetna or Blue Cross or any of those private insurance companies, they are very different from the public insurance companies that are governed by Medicaid and the federal government. Now, I know I'm preaching to the choir because a lot of you are fully acquainted with the difference, but I want to point out that and, and emphasize that the public insurance company, the Medicaid companies, are obligated to comply with the 14th Amendment, and that is equal protection under the law for rich, for poor, healthy, disabled, or anywhere in between. Medicaid is a treatment funding mechanism for disabled people, not just for poor people, as it's often misrepresented to be. Medicaid funds treatment in 33 states, regardless of family income. So in three quarters of the United States, it doesn't matter whether you're 
got three cars in the garage and one of them's a Lamborghini. Or if you don't have a garage, you know, and you're dealing with walking to work and, you know, that. Now we can debate philosophically or morally whether that's reasonable. But it is part of the 14th Amendment that they are entitled to getting free treatment just like every other person who's enrolled in Medicaid. So the first step in getting this kind of treatment program into the lives of children who need it is to get the kids enrolled in Medicaid. Okay, so you get them enrolled in Medicaid, then they are covered under the EPSDT mandate, early and periodic screening, diagnosis, and treatment, which makes them eligible for funding for any covered service under EPSDT. Now, EPSDT covers a range of things, durable medical equipment, vision, hearing, dental, and behavioral health services. So literally, it can act as icing on whatever else existed. Medicaid is always the payer of last resort. You've all heard that. It's not true. Medicaid is not the payer of last resort for covered services in a school. It's the payer of first resort, according to the Federal uh, Individuals with Disabilities Education Act and the Medicaid Act. So any school district that is providing any of these covered behavioral services can bill Medicaid directly, can be paid by Medicaid directly, and not charge the local school district a dime for them. But they do, of course, because they're schools. They have their own laws, their own courts, their own cosmic reality, and that allows them to bill the local taxpayers for these cover services at the same time that they're billing the federal government through the Medicaid system. But let's leave that. It's good money if you can get it. The bottom line is Medicaid is a keg with two taps. There is the pipe going into the schools, and I'll show you a slide about that momentarily. The Medicaid funds go into the school through that enormous pipe, no oversight, no managed care, nothing. There is a tap coming out of the top of that keg through which parents can deliver Medicaid funding to their children in their home or their school, utterly independently of the funds going into the school. So it literally is, and I say this is a, a truism, Medicaid and EPSDT is the greatest funding secret ever concealed. And it's tragic that it is so well concealed. I've talked to innumerable people who found out about it by accident, and then after they find out about it, they're told more or less, you keep this quiet, or they're made to feel guilty or embarrassed about having access to the treasure chest. It is a treasure chest, and it's something that every child with a disability, if they can enroll in Medicaid, has access to, in the home, in the school, and in the community. All right, so let's say we get past the prescribing barrier, and we are delivering the services correctly. That means we are measuring treatment outcome, and I'll talk to you about how to do that really successfully, and that we're taking data from the parent, not just the treatment provider. You gotta be careful because if you don't take outcome data from the treatment provider, you're gonna be held accountable that you're not really doing treatment. But that's not enough because insurance companies can attack data supplied by the provider. Well, you're just doing that to prove that you need to be in the kid's life, et cetera, et cetera. Insurance companies are reluctant to accuse parents of being criminals. Parents of kids with disabilities very often have aligned themselves with political influences that in some ways protect them from that kind of harassment. The bottom line is if you have data from a parent that is reliable and valid and can show that the child is getting better but is not finished yet, they're not quite done, that is a guarantee of funding through the federal Medicaid EPSDT funding stream, and although they may complain bitterly about it, when you finally get to an administrative law judge or somebody else who knows the law, they just basically shut up and sign the check. At least that's been my experience for many, many years, three decades in fact. 
So the bottom line is they make bullets, we make armor, and I want to show you how to create the armor. The biggest part of the armor creation is outcome data collection. So in that sense, we collect data every week. We use ABA, Applied Behavior Analysis Principles, and Full Fidelity Wraparound Technology. Those are both evidence-based practices. So what we're doing literally is putting evidence-based practices to use in a wraparound cup and calling it effective treatment. And finally, you have to apply what I'm calling a problem-solving emphasis, not just behavior. Let me give you a little insight about that. We've all heard about antecedent, behavior, consequence, right? A, B, C. This is the pinnacle that a lot of teachers aspire to. It's as high as they get in an understanding of mental illness symptoms. Unfortunately, some of the people with BCBA tattooed to their foreheads aspire to that, exa that exact same low standard. Let me replace that. Get rid of antecedents. Let's get rid of consequences. Let's talk about you have a skill deficit over here, which produces reliably inept behavior. If you don't know how to do anything except some miserable approximation that is so far below everybody else in your peer group, you're going to be stigmatized, you're going to have problems, etc. And our solution in treating that is to impose consequences. For example, you get handed a 10-page or a 10-item math worksheet and you look at it and go crazy inside because you can't do that and you run out the room. In the standard ABA functional behavior analysis world, somebody looks at that and says, we need to put a consequence here, and we need to bring them back to the classroom and take away their points or do something other punitive to make them motivated to stop that inappropriate aberrant behavior. This is kindergarten. If they have a skill deficit, they are overwhelmed, for example, by age-appropriate performance expectations. They can't stand it. They don't have the words to say, I can't do this. They no tolerance to make those statements, so they run out the room. Skill deficit is I can't communicate my feelings, my needs, nothing. I feel disempowered, incapable, inadequate, so I will escape by whatever means is available to me. The solution is to remediate the skills, teach the kid what's missing over here, and by that means the behavior problem drops right out of the repertoire. It just drops because kids don't do anything stupid. They are growing, developing beings. They don't behave stupidly. They do the best they can with what they've got, and it turns out to be some twisted paradigm of, you know, coping. So the answer, if you, pre if you prevent them from learning new skills by imposing consequence after consequence, here's an example of that. Can you imagine me telling you how to get to the airport by telling you each time you made a mistake? <laughs> Honestly, you'll never get there. And it's the exact same thing with children or anybody else who needs to learn something. They need to be taught, not chasing after them. Hey, come here, come here, come here, come here get in front and lead them. No, let's go this way. That's what you do if you're a competent ethical treatment provider. Insurance companies don't want you to do that. They want you to collect bean counting data. What was the frequency of his behavior this week? Today, last hour? Okay, I'm gonna show you how to cope with that demand for frequency data in a way that's humane and effective. EPSDT, as I said, started actually in 1967. It's been around for 51 years and counting. You've heard of the Affordable Care Act? That is an attempt to bring EPSDT standards to the population at large. That's really what it is. I was invited to the White House as a champion of change for children's mental health services. Barack Obama wasn't there, but hey, it's the White House, you know? Okay, it was a PR opportunity for the Affordable Care Act. So I put my hand up to 200 people in the room, and I said, I don't know if any of you realize, but 
We've had an equivalent of the Affordable Care Act in this country for 50 years. It's called EPSDT. And the guy at the front of the room in, from the National Institutes of Mental Health nodding his head, yep. Almost nobody in that room understood that EPSDT funding, and there it all is up on the screen, existed for the purpose of treating maladaptive behavior in addition to these other things. So when you've got a kid who's acting up in school and the school district is trying to tell lies and say he doesn't need an aid because he's functioning on grade level as if that's some absolute measure of competence, right? If you dumb down the test, anybody's functioning on grade level. No secret, right? Okay. So if a kid has a behavioral need, and you enroll the child in Medicaid, and in almost all states, you can enroll a kid in Medicaid just simply because he's got an IEP. Poof, done. And as soon as he's enrolled in Medicaid, he now has access to EPSDT funding. For all of this, the school can provide it, or the school can contract with a private psychologist who's enrolled in Medicaid to deliver these behavior support services. There is an absolutely horrific movement afoot in the United States to exclude psychologists as private practitioners in Medicaid. They're this close to doing it in Pennsylvania. A psychologist, right, and I'm not qualified to intervene in children's lives who have mental illness symptoms or behavior problems. WTF makes no sense, but that's what they're doing. The schools can tap Medicaid, they do it with reckless abandon, I think. But that little tap coming out the front and the top of the keg goes into parents' lives and they can use that money in the home or the school or the community to deliver EPSDT funding for behavioral support. Once parents understand that, they can begin to use that tap and deliver these services. Yeah, your question. We have a big issue with getting the schools to provide a lot of the service like that? Not, okay, there's two reasons why they may not. The first is the child can't enroll in Medicaid because of the financial barrier. But if the kid is below the federal poverty level, the child, not the family, in 33 states they can enroll in Medicaid and as soon as they enroll in Medicaid, by federal law since 1989, they have to be able to access EPSDT funding. The schools, here's the other problem, this is part two. The schools used to sign up for EPSDT and Medicaid terrifically in the 90s and early, earlier in this century. They used to sign up, but then they were hit with all kinds of clawbacks because they were doing it, forgive me, stupidly. The kid gets OTPT or speech every Thursday and they just bill every Thursday even when Thursday falls on Christmas Day. So money was coming back out of schools, you know, 200, I'm sorry, 20 million from New Jersey alone back in the early 2000s. So a lot of schools said, no, no, we're not going to do this anymore. This is an unmanageable program, et cetera. It's not if you do it competently. And some states don't want to do it competently. Remember I said schools are, they have their own courts, their own laws, their own world. And you can't penetrate that world for love of money. What you can do is empower the parent to seek EPSDT funding for their child. And then it's a matter of finding an appropriately credentialed practitioner in that state who can deliver those services. This is how I do consultations all over the place, helping parents know. Let me give you an example. EPSDT is like ice cream. Every state has its version of ice cream. Some put nuts in it, some put caramel on it, whatever. But it's all ice cream. And it has to be stored in a cooled container so it's preserved. You have to tell a parent how to find the ice cream box. And sometimes you have to go all the way to the governor's office to have them tell you who handles EPSDT in the state. More often than not, the state Medicaid agency is the Department of Human Services. There's some permutation on that. If they lie to you and tell you, no, it's not available, that can be the cause of a civil rights complaint 
and now the family calls this Office for Civil Rights without a lawyer, and they make a complaint. I'm being deprived of access to federally entitled EPSDT funding, and Washington calls your state capital and talks to the person in the state Medicaid agency and says, what the hell are you doing? This is an entitlement since 89. Stop lying to the people in your state. And poof, the curtain gets raised. Look, the bottom line is if you're an ethical practitioner, you have to do that. It's even saying that in the law. You have to re report incidents where civil rights are being violated. So EPSDT funding is, in fact, a civil right. It's in the Social Security Act, has been since 1967. So when you have a family that's being told, no, you can't, the answer correctly is, yes, you can, and here's how. Now, some of the states are getting very creative. They're pulling psychologists off the line and saying, you can't do this anymore. Not every state has gone down that dark hole. Lots of states allow psychologists to enroll in Medicaid, be medical assistants, Medicaid providers, oversee behavioral health services in homes, schools, communities. It can be done. And I'll be happy to help anybody who is seeking that kind of support. I really need that support on how to help my families with that. What I wrote was the book, The Issachar Project, that documents all of this stuff. There's a two-page thing in here, start here, go down this list. It's this, you know, step-by-step -step process of how to find out where they keep the ice cream and how to get the cabinet open. So it, it's a good resource. It's up, up on Amazon. Send me a note and I'll send you the Issachar Project. You have copies of the Kosser scale over here, a little blue book. That's a summary of the outcome measurement system that I came up with. It'll be helpful as well. This is an important memo. It was sent from the Medicaid agency in Pennsylvania to the Department of Education. And it says, literally, this is a quote, the health-related services a student receives through the school-based access program are separate and apart from the medical assistance or Medicaid services a child receives outside of the school setting. And then it goes on to say that additionally, there is no cap or limit on the total amount of money that may be paid by the MA program for school-based access program services or MA services that the MA eligible child may receive. This is federal law. So, let me just see if I'm understanding this correctly. So when they say your child can only have 20 minutes of speech therapy once a week, It's an education service. But this is saying otherwise. The parents have access to broaden that amount of treatment. That's correct. Okay. The parents That's can what say I heard. Okay. Yeah, the Thank parents you. can say, okay, stop telling me there's no money for mm -hmm. this. There is, and you people can access it. Don't tell me you can't. It may be inconvenient for you. But I'm going to call the Office for Civil Rights, and you guys are going to get a wake-up call. Or we can do this politely. I mean, the bottom line is there's a big dog in this fight, and nobody knows it. One of the best organizations that I have ever encountered in terms of up-to-date knowledge of social and political and factual information is the National Health Law Program. They just published a book called Children's Mental Health Services, The Right to Community-Based Care. This is August 17, 2018. Tune into the National Health Law Program. So much of the stuff that I've learned about Medicaid and EPSDT over the years came straight from these guys. Dennis Embry's a, a friend. And he came up with a paper years ago with uh, Anthony Bigland called Evidence-Based Kernels. There's 50 of them. And if you embed those kernels into your behavioral health treatment program, now you've got bona fide evidence-based practices, and it's another way of closing the armor against being attacked by an insurance company. Use evidence-based practices, use ABA, use wraparound philosophy, 
Do all of those things in your service delivery, prescribe it correctly, and take outcome data smartly. And I'm going to show you how to do that. Just for the sake of argument in Pennsylvania, this is the model that I'm advocating. A physician is a type 31 provider. That would include a pediatrician. Pediatricians are able to bill for TSS, therapeutic staff support, mobile therapy, behavior specialist consultations, in all of its permutations. So you, you recruit a pediatrician and you say, listen, doctor, I know that you recognize the value of behavioral health integrated in your practice. Everybody does. I'm going to show you how to bring in behavioral health experts without costing you anything. In fact, if you bill for it, you can make a couple bucks in addition to meeting the costs of this service, and it's part of your medical practice. I can show you how to do that. There's the model. So I talked about TSS, Therapeutic Staff Support. This is a sample of the data that we produce regularly. The vertical black line is the point at which TSS was introduced. On the left of the diagram, you can see things are pretty horrendous. There are nines, eights, tens. That means that things are going off the rails. The higher the score, the worse things are. After the implementation of TSS, what happens? The problems go down. But the best thing about this is, if the TSS takes off a week, the problems don't go right back up. There is no halo effect. These people, these young adults, for the most part, we work with people who are older as well, but they're going into kids' life. They're going into the home, the school, they're doing this. And in some ways, they act like a force field in the school, repelling some of the more pestilential influences that are surrounding the kid. So he's no longer an object of ridicule and harassment and entertainment for the more sociopathically inclined peers. I was talking with Dennis Embry the other day about this. And he's got a brilliant insight about how to change the culture of a classroom and get all of these other kids, these I call them pestilential influences, recruit them to be helpful, habilitative influences. It's just behavioral psychology, and he figured out how to do it. He's tested it and he's got actual bona fide population level data that shows that it works. So now you can recruit all of these little characters to be habilitators rather than destroyers, and it's not so necessary to have my staff come into this kid's life as a protective shield. Dennis's program, the Pax Good Behavior game, is not ubiquitous yet. It should be, but it's not. So if you don't have that kind of preventive system in your school, you need the, the force field. Got to. Because the kid's not going to make it without it. You know, they have just simply too many negative influences attacking them every single hour, let alone day. Okay, so we bring this in, and this person is the therapeutic staff support provider, the TSS. They go to the kid's classroom, they follow them throughout the school day, 25, 30 or more hours a week, Monday to Friday, in school, in the home, in the community, demonstrating through modeling how the teacher might relate to the child better, how the parent, how the siblings, how the peers. It's just a terrific program. Much better than me sitting in an office listening to a kid lie to me once a week about how it's going on in his life. That's the standard most psychologists aspire to. It's obscene. So I've got this model, and any psychologist so far in the United States can probably do this by affiliating with a pediatrician, if not doing it themselves as an enrolled professional in Medicaid. These are two of the studies that were done in the last decade. Uh, the first at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in 2007 and the second in July of 2010, our data has been analyzed by Villanova University and Immaculata University as recently as 2016. So we've got all of this data saying that there is a 75% improvement rate within four months 
from the kids exposed to the treatment programs that I'm going to describe. 75% get better in four months or less, and the treatment stabilization occurs for the subsequent year. They're continuing to get better. So with all of this, we do our own research, and we look, going back to 2012, 23 children, 53 treatment plans investigated, treatment periods lasting from 28 days to 59 months. So we're talking about ridiculously short treatment periods. Some of these kids get treatment for a month, and they don't need it anymore because we hit the nail right smack on top of the head. Now let me talk about hitting the nail. Actually, it's a tack. It's not so big as a nail. But if you try to drive a tack with a toothpick, you're going to break lots of toothpicks and prove the kid can't be helped. And now you've spread your $10 million a mile wide and an inch deep, and plaques go up in politician offices and certificates of excellence get awarded, and everybody thinks they're doing just a wonderful job for those 10,000 children, none of whom are getting what they need. And let me tell you what they need. The National Academy of Sciences, chartered by the US Congress, 150 years ago said in 2001 that a child with autism symptoms, and that's a lot of kids with ADHD as well, needs a minimum of 25 hours of intensive individualized treatment every week year round in order to have a reasonable probability of symptom abatement. 25 hours and they surveyed 11 different treatment modalities to come to that conclusion. Now the book they published is called Educating Children with Autism. Why? Because the Department of Education funded it. That's all. These are treatment modalities. Greenspan's uh, DIR models in there, discrete trial training, all of the things that we know about as treatment modalities are in that book. So 25 is the minimum. Academy of Pediatrics, twice in 2007 and again in 2012, said the exact same thing. 25 is the minimum. So if those national standards say 25 is the minimum, how in God's name can an insurance company defend a claim that he only needs 5 or 7 or maybe 10? It's irresponsible. It, you could call it criminal. You could call it criminal, but you have to defend against that. So let me cut to the chase and show you how you can defend against that, because God knows you can't drive a tack with a toothpick. We've got the data that shows that the tack can be driven with a tack hammer. Some kids need a little larger tack hammer. They need 30 hours of treatment a week. Some get 35. We do that. We prescribe it. The insurance companies authorize it. Their adversaries, I'm not nasty with them, I'm just affirmative and we follow the law. This is the big secret. This is how you take outcome data and prove to an insurance company that the services are necessary. It comes in two parts. The top part talks about frequency, the bottom part talks about severity. Bottom line is you're taking a measure on a scale from 1 to 10 for frequency. You're not counting incidents. That's demeaning. You can't tell a parent, I want you to write down every time he throws something. Stop. You can't demean a child like that. But you can talk to the parent and say, look, here's a scale from 1 to 10. Once a week, I'm going to call you, and I need you to tell me what the frequency of his throwing things is. And you look at the scale and it says zero to one is non-existent or virtually non-existent. Less than once in a month and not worrisome is a one. Two is the upper limit of normal or tolerable for a child of the same or approximate age. Three is a few times in the past week and almost every week in the past month, that's a three, to every single week in the past month, that's a four. A five is many times in the past week and almost every week in the past month to every single week in the past month. That's a six. 
So what I'm doing here is I created an interval scale. A score is a four. It's not a five, it's not a six, it's a four. And once the parents can become familiar with this, we laminate this and give it to them and say, look, every week we're going to call you and we're going to use this scale for you to evaluate your child's frequency and severity of misbehavior. Within two weeks, they've got it. Because when we call, we say, okay, Mrs. Jones, last week he was a frequency of three, so he's getting close to being finished. What did he do this week? Three last week, did it go up? Did it go down? Did it go way up? Wait. And they come up with a number that is reliable and valid. You can reproduce it. You can guarantee if you call or you call or you call, they're going to give you the same number. That's reliability. Validity is, does it measure what it says it's measuring? It's measuring frequency. For God's sake, how could it be misinterpreted? So bottom line, what I'm talking about here is a strategy called Criterion Referenced Measures, CRM. This is how Mrs. Jones in third grade comes up with a grade for her kids. They've been doing this for hundreds of years, Criterion Referenced Measurement. Instead of giving the kids a test and you using a norm reference measure like an intelligence test, comparing this child with all of these other kids across the world at the same age, it stopped. You're giving the kid a test on how well did he master the, the curriculum that was presented to him two weeks ago in this class. Criterion referenced measurement. If you use an interval scale to do criterion referenced measurement, you have a statistically reliable and valid means of monitoring progress. That's the big secret, because once it's accepted as a statistically reliable and valid measure of progress, then you can say, beyond a shadow of a doubt, or at least to a degree of certainty, the probability being less than one in a hundred, or one in a thousand, that that result could occur by chance. You have now documented through a single subject with repeated measures, experimental design, using a reliable and valid statistical assessment of outcomes to say whether or not the kid is getting better, is getting worse, or has stayed the same. This is the answer to a prayer for a treatment provider. Who can say that? Nobody except if they use the Kosser scale. Ta-da! Okay, so frequency is only half of the scale. The other half is severity. So again, you want to measure from Mrs. Jones' perspective, and it's very important that you measure it from the parent's perspective, not the teacher, not the principal, not the guidance counselor, and certainly not your own staff, because God knows they'll cook the books just to keep their job, right? Or at least that's what the insurance companies will claim. But I have yet to hear an insurance company say out loud, the parents are lying. They're inflating the scores so that they can keep these incredibly intrusive services in their home, in their life. That's crazy. Parents don't want to have our staff in their home bothering them. And you know, Now, schools are another story. They may want our staff on site big time because they think that absolves them of responsibility for doing what they're supposed to do in the school. No. We actually tell parents what they're entitled to from the school. And now the parents become more empowered advocates for getting the school to do what it has to do. Or they can call the Office for Civil Rights because there's a department just related to education civil rights in addition to the Department for Disabilities Civil Rights. You see what I'm talking about here? All of this is free. All of this is without a lawyer. All of this is extremely effective because once the school district superintendent gets a call from Washington saying basically, what the hell are you doing? Things change. And sometimes parents get the phone call and says, all right, look, for you, but for you, get it? Exactly. You've seen that. Exactly. Okay, so 
working with youth though that are in um, custody of social services, oh, okay. and you don't have a parent to be getting the data from, who are you? One of the strategies that has been used in some states is the most heinous thing I can imagine. They sick children and youth on families who were too troublesome and the family gets evaluated by some character who accuses the mother of having Munchausen's by proxy. The kids are taken from the family, distributed to the foster care system. It's egregious, doesn't even come close to measuring it. Most states have abandoned that requirement that you have to give up custody of your kid in order to get treatment. Most states have. If you're in a state that hasn't quite dawned into the modern era. You know, they're still walking with their knuckles dragging. If they have not graduated into the modern era, call the Office for Civil Rights and say, look, 80% of the United States doesn't subject parents to this level of cruelty and abuse. And frankly, it's wrong for the people in this state to continue to be subjected to it. There's no database that says that giving custody over to the state enhances outcomes. In fact, it may very well suppress outcomes. There's no end of stories about kids going into foster care, not getting the level of care and attention that their parents had been giving them, and dying in that system. So it's just plain indefensible that it happens. And you know, hopefully we can actively promote a more sane model for child development. It may be a political battle rather than a, a treatment battle, but you know sometimes politics, you gotta go outside of the state, and that's where the Office for Civil Rights can come in very handy. Let's talk about the severity ratings, because that's an integral part of treatment outcome measurement. It's not just how often it happens, it's how bad it is. So you can see a zero to one, the behavior's not worrisome, there are either no, or almost no negative consequences imaginable. That's a zero or a one. Two, again, is the upper limit of normal or tolerable for a child of the same approximate age. Now, parents can say it's tolerable. Now, you or I looking at it might say, oh God, that's at least a three if not a four, but we're not the parent. We can't take over. We can plead with them and say, look, he could be so much more mature. He you know, don't throw us out yet because we're monitoring the kid's outcome. When he gets to a two, we're finished. We'll be happy to leave. And we're telling you up front, we want to leave when he gets to a two. A three, the child's behavior is severe enough to worry you almost every time, that's a three, to every single time. Now, we, th we talk about worry you. A five or a six, you characterize the child's behavior as very serious. It's an order of magnitudes higher. It's not just worrying, it's now very serious. A seven or an eight is alarmingly serious, so it's another order of magnitude higher. And a nine or a 10 is, okay, it's catastrophic. A 10 is a hospital admission. A 10 is a death. He actually killed somebody. So do you work with kids who are at the 10 level? Hell no. EPSDT funds children who can be maintained safely in their home and community. If it starts heading up an eight, a nine, at that point you have to go for a placement in a safe setting before it hits a 10. So it's got this built-in emergency alarm system that goes off. Now here's the best part. Are my staff taking data every week themselves? They're taking data every day. So if Mary looks at the child and says, geez, he's a six or a seven, easy. So we'll take our data and it's a six or a seven. If mom says it's a 10, it's a 10, it's a 10. At that point, we have to talk to the mom and say, look, you, you don't have to make the alarm that loud. He doesn't have to be a 10 to get help. If you keep saying he's a 10, he's a 10, he's a 10, you're defining a flat line. The kid's not getting better. Either that or he's dead. He's a machine. He's a piece of wood. Well, even wood grows until you kill it. So there's variance in the system. 
It's never this, 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 the same. Right? So you help parents understand that. You're actually giving the insurance company proof that you're lying. Okay, Mrs. Jones? And if we're saying it's a six or a seven, you need to see things our way, or we're not really helping you, are we? Because you're supposed to be collaborating with us. That isn't we agree with you. We don't run a deli. You don't come in asking for a hoagie with no mustard, and we slap it together here to get paid. That's criminal. That's actually fraud. We're making it satisfactory to the parent to do what they want. Wait a minute, we're the professionals. We do an evaluation, we monitor progress, we render treatment, we prescribe it, we take input from the parent to make sure we're doing it to meet their so social and cultural standards, but they don't call the shots. In the wraparound model, the parents are given an inflated, I think, status, that they actually control it. That's a mistake. We need to listen to parents, and they have the ultimate authority to say, get out, you do it my way or the highway, and then we as professionals have the authority to say, we've done as much as we can. We wish you and your family well, but we can't operate under these circumstances because that's not ethical. If my staff aren't the most knowledgeable people when they go to a meeting about behavior change, there's a screw loose. So you put the PACS Good Behavior game in the school if you can, and that'll help terrifically for everybody. But when you've got a kid who is already off the rails, you've got to bring a more intensive individualized treatment program to bear, and that's where my staff come in, funded under EPSDT. We take this outcome data. Now, here's something that some people bring up. Well, wait a minute. You're doing services in a school. How can you ask the parent what's going on? Well, implicitly that says, the parents have no clue what's going on in the school. Oh my God. That's a prescription for disaster. You have to put the parents in an authority position. Because the IEP, remember, it's a contract between the school and who? The parent to coordinate the education of the child. The school doesn't take the kid and say, we'll teach him. Thank you. See you. They can't legally do that. They have to engage the parent. So my staff show up and the school goes, oh, thank God, we've got somebody to monitor Billy. Well, yeah, we monitor Billy, we help Billy, but we also empower Billy's parent to be a more viable force in that child's education, and now she's calling for a due process hearing. The parents need to understand how much power they actually have. And you always tell them, you don't make noise, you make persistent and polite input. That's all. And you do it from a standpoint of knowledge and power. Put your feet on the ground. Don't jump up and down. Just make your point. And if the school doesn't listen to you, wait for it. The Office for Civil Rights will. Guaranteed. Okay. So it's all power politics, and it's just understanding the law. and. and what you can tap to move the ball forward in a responsible and professional way. That's all I'm advocating for. So here's a behavior record form that my staff ask the parent to fill out every week. They call Mrs. Jones and say, okay, Mrs. Jones, let's talk about Bobby. How frequently did he hit people last week? And they write down, using the frequency scale, using the severity scale, those numbers always a number between 1 and 10, and it just accumulates over the course of time. At the end of the authorization period, which is anywhere from 13 to 18 weeks, they create a graph by filling this in, and that's what the graph looks like. So you can see at the very top here, where it went off the charts, it went bad, that's when grandma came to live with the kid in the home. And grandma's rules trump everybody's, right? Of course they do. She's grandma. And that's when things go off the rails, when there is inconsistent parental supervision or guidance. We turn this page 90 degrees, and the staff on these lines, which are now horizontal lines, they write in other events that happened, like how close were you to the child on average this day when you gave your intervention? So now we're measuring proximity. 
if the proximity increases and the staff is doing their good work from a greater and greater distance, that's called titration. We're making it less potent because it's from a greater distance. And the other side of it is they're also recording the hierarchy of prompts. Did you have to, to physically move the kid? That's physical guidance. Did you have to put your hand on the kid? That's physical prompting. Did you have to just verbally tell him what to do? Could you do it with a gesture from across the room like, you know, zip it, you know, whatever. If the kid's listening at this distance and at this low level of prompting, what more do you need to show? You need to move out of the kid's range, still monitor him, and if he doesn't need your help for four consecutive weeks, that's when you stop delivering 25 hours a week of treatment. You don't listen to some soothsayer channeling Nostradamus saying, well, in four weeks he's going to need 20 hours, and then four weeks later he's going to need 10, and four weeks later he's going to need five. What the? That, is that an ethical practice of anything? In the absence of data, how can you make predictions like that? You can't, unless you work for an insurance company and you get a pass. That becomes magically an ethical practice of psychology if you're working for an insurance company. How? There's loads of parents all over the country who say, I wish you could come to well, the simple fact is I can, not physically, but I can be a case manager advising all over the country, and that's what I want to do. Because all I have to do is get one pediatrician in Arkansas on board with this, and now he hires 30 behavior specialists. I can even do the billing if I need to. It's all electronic. So I can oversee it remotely and how quality assurance, can you imagine what this could turn into? It really could be the best thing that ever happened in so many kids' lives. You know, I'm thankful to be back here where I'm talking about this again. Well, just so you know, you inspired me. Mm -hmm. And doing better than my job. And I'm Good. really, it really sinking in. And I'm really there is so, so much... Better. As providers, we really, most of us, have no idea how many cards we can play. I mean, you know, it's a five-card hand, you know, and they only dealt you three cards. Wait a minute, I got two more. And now you're playing with a full hand. That's what I'm showing you, right? Yes. Okay. Here's how my staff take data. Every single hour, there was nobody at the kids' school from 8 to 9, but 9 to 10, there were three episodes where Madeline showed a lack of safety awareness. And from 10 to 11, there were two episodes. You see what they're doing? They are counting beans. God knows you've got to count beans. But when the day is all said and done, they're also measuring how close they are to the child on average. And they're also measuring the level of prompting that they had to use and they're taking numbers, counting up the number of times that this lack of safety awareness was manifested, and this measures the amount of replacement behavior in the safety domain that the child displayed. So bottom line is, by taking data at this level, they can definitively say to Madeline's mother, look, your kid's doing a four at most, maybe a five at, we can come to a consensus accurately with a single number that characterizes your kid's frequency and severity. So don't keep saying it's a nine, it's a 10. Stop it, because we're gonna stop services because you are documenting that you're not listening. We have to collaborate. We can't fix your kid while you're at the spa, right? If we're collaborating, we're in it, we'll be the best advocate you ever had, and we'll work hard to get you what your kid needs. If you're not collaborating, we can't stay here. That's a legal and ethical standard in the EPS DT Medicaid rules. Finally, this is the last page of data collection. Every day, the staff are circling which interventions from the treatment plan they implemented. And at the end of the week, you see down here, BSC supervisor, the supervisor reviews the progress notes once a week, every week. 
And they notice things like, well, you never circle this one. Does that mean it's not necessary anymore? Or you always circle this one. Does that mean that's the only thing you do? Please, are you kidding? Everybody gets sick of strawberry ice cream after a while, you know? You've got to change it up. You've got to respond to the kids' practices. And if you do that, that's called applied behavior analysis. So here is the frequency scale, and here is directly from that data sheet that I just looked at. So according to this, Madeline shows a lack of safety awareness by mouthing objects, eloping from caregivers, and not responding to the word stop. And when you look at lack of safety awareness, you rate it on this scale for frequency, and then you rate the next thing in terms of severity, and you do that across the board for all of this behavior. And at the end of that, you come up with the graph, and you know how close the staff was, and you know the level of prompting they used, which is not actually displayed on this graph because we just added that to the graph. This is an evolving system that I keep improving. Every time I do one of these talks, it's like, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, we could do that too. It's another layer of armor. Because the insurance companies are getting good. They're using armor-piercing rounds. Mm -hmm. And you've got to be able to beat them. And it's all described in the little blue book that's mm -hmm. over there. Um, please take, if you want, take two copies. It sells for the whopping cost of 15 bucks on Amazon. Thank you. Yeah, they're right over there on the uh, shameless self-promotional literature thing. Yeah, take two. Okay. Yeah, you, you, you guys, the National Federation is a terrific advocacy organization. So you're the best people to take this resource with you. You know, use it, pass it around, help other people use it. And if you work in Pennsylvania, Wake them up in Harrisburg. Tell them to stop trying to throw psychologists out of Medicaid, mm -hmm. behavioral health. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you.